Great. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, so we're very glad to have Tony Yoyu from Caltech, and it's also uh, sort of a welcome to California a little bit since he has just moved. So we're very pleased to have him have him here, and he's going to tell us about non-Archimedean quantum K theory and Kermov Witten invariance. Thank you very much, Ravi, for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation. It's my great honor to speak uh, at this seminar. So the title of my talk is Non-Archimedean Quantum K Theory and Gromov Witten Invariance. It's based on my uh, joint works with uh, Marlo Porta and also working some work in progress. So uh, if you have any questions or comments during my talk, please do not hesitate uh, just to interrupt me and ask your questions. Okay, here's the plan of my talk. I will begin with motivations from mirror symmetry, why we consider these uh, non-Archimedean invariants. And then I will give a brief review of uh, derived non-Archimedean geometry followed by the representability theorem. <clears throat> and then I will discuss the moduli stack of non-Archimedean stable maps and the Gromov of compactness theorem. After that, uh, I will introduce the numerical enumerative invariants, the numbers that we really want to count. Uh, and finally, I will explain how properties of the numerical invariants will follow readily from some natural geometric relations between the derived moduli stacks. Okay, so first of all, uh, why we consider these non-Archimedean invariants? The motivations come uh, from mirror symmetry. Um, so mirror symmetry uh, is about Calabi-L manifolds. Let's review. Recall that a smooth projective variety X over C is called a color BL if its canonical bundle uh, KX is trivial. In other words, it has a nowhere vanishing holomorphic volume form. So examples uh, include elliptic curves, abelian varieties, K3 surfaces, hypersurfaces of degree D plus one uh, in projective space uh, CPD of dimension D. And um, mirror symmetry is a conjectural duality between Calabi-L varieties. Roughly, it says that for any Calabi-L variety X, there exists a so-called mirror variety X check, such that uh, a list of deep geometric relations hold between X and X check. <clears throat> so the relations involve uh, Hodge structures, gromov witten invariants, Fukaya categories, derived category of coherent sheaves, SYZ torus vibrations, uh, and it's an ever-growing list. Yeah, are there any questions at this point? Okay, so let me continue. Um, yeah, so this is the rough idea of mirror symmetry. But a more careful study reveals that mirror symmetry is not really a duality between individual Calabi-L varieties. But rather, it is a duality between so-called maximally degenerating families of Calabi-L varieties. So when we look at, look at the problem more carefully, we found that uh, we should not really state the duality uh, as something between individual varieties, but rather we should state the duality as something between families. So, and also we want to impose a condition called maximal degeneration. Uh, roughly, it just asks the variety to degenerate in some very bad way. So an example is the classical type three degeneration of K3 surfaces. We have K3 surface and degenerates into like a soccer ball. So here, being maximal uh, just means that the dual intersection complex has the maximal dimension. OK. Um, yeah. So in general, when we consider any algebraic family of varieties over a punctured disk, so we consider such a family over a punctured disk with coordinate t, 
then uh, we obtain a single algebraic variety over uh, this C double parenthesis T, the field of formal Laurent series. And let's note that this field of formal Laurent series uh, has the structure of a non-Archimedean field in the sense that we have a norm uh, on this field given by uh, exponential of minus the valuation with respect to t. And it is called non-Archimedean, it's because uh, the norm satisfies the strong uh, triangular inequality, um, which is the, the norm of x plus y is less than or equal to the maximum of the norm of x and the norm of y. So for this reason, it's called a non-Archimedean field. And what's really nice, also very surprising, is that uh, we actually have a very nice theory of non-Archimedean geometry, um, which is analogous to the theory of uh, complex analytical geometry, but uh, over non-Archimedean fields. So you know that uh, for varieties over complex numbers, we can consider either from the algebraic viewpoint or from the analytic viewpoint. We can either work with in terms of algebraic geometry or works in terms of complex analytic geometry. But here, it's the same situation that for varieties over such non-Archimedean fields, we also have a, a corresponding analytic theory called the non-Archimedean geometry. And of course, just as in complex geometry, uh, the analytic theory is more general than just the things coming from uh, varieties. We also have analytic spaces that uh, are that do not come from algebraic ones. <clears throat> okay, and um, and this non-Archimedean geometry actually uh, gives rise to more general, a more general and a more symmetric formulation of mirror symmetry. Uh, as a duality between non-Archimedean Calabi <coughs> Calabi manifolds uh, with some conditions as as before. Yeah. So let me just recapitulate that the the original rough idea about mirror symmetry is some duality between Calabi manifolds, but once we try to really kind of state the duality in a precise way, it doesn't it. It's not like this. So we have to consider families. And then if we consider families, it's just very natural to consider uh, this non-Archimedean viewpoint. And then we can formulate mirror symmetry as a duality simply be between non-Archimedean, like individual non-Archimedean Calabian manifolds. And this is, in one sense, uh, more general because, as I mentioned, not all non-Archimedean spaces come from algebraic families. And the second, it's also more symmetric. Somehow, in the mirror symmetry classical formulation, like one side is some start with some variety, on the other side, uh, we get some degeneration, and now we just have both sides, the non-Archimedean spaces. So, so maybe I have, a, I have a question which maybe is naive because I'm so used to thinking in a purely algebraic world, but in the complex analytic world, I guess mirror symmetry also works more generally in the case of presumably non-algebraic Calabias. Maybe I'm l more frightened of the complex ones than I, the non-Archimedean ones, but maybe that's a sign of my... <laughs> but somehow, yeah, you are, def you are definitely right that in the complex world, we can also somehow generalize mirror symmetry to some kind of non-algebraic, either Kähler or even non-Kähler uh, manifolds, and that's somehow another direction of the generalization. Here, this direction of generalizing to this non-Archimedean setting is somehow more uh, algebraic, more oriented for algebraic geometers. <laughs> Yeah, of course, we can also have the other kind of direction, which is more uh, like analytical. 
or more differential, more oriented for differential geometers? Thank you for the question. Okay, um, so actually there are more more important advantages of considering this non-Archimedean approach. Um, first, uh, working uh, in this non-Archimedean world, it's as if we are working formally in algebraic geometry, and then we don't need to worry about complex analytic issues of complex, complex analytic convergence. And that somehow greatly simplifies many problems because now, even if we care about complex geometry, it becomes like a separate question. You can first set up everything without worrying about convergence. And later it's a separate question whether it converges or not. And we know from examples that many, in many examples, they just don't converge. Okay. And the second uh, is that uh, the SYZ torus vibration, which is a bigger conjecture uh, in, in the complex analytical world, uh, and it's still uh, open, we, it's still open and very difficult uh, to, to study. And this uh, torus vibration actually uh, is easier to do in the non-Archimedean case. So, uh, in 2019, with Nikes and Xu, uh, we we showed that in the non-Archimedean case, in the non-Archimedean setting, this conjectural SYZ torus vibration can be uh, explicitly constructed. Um, and the third advantage is that uh, in the non-Archimedean setting, we have new ways for counting curves with boundaries. Um, in the complex analytical world, uh, there are many technical difficulties uh, for counting curves with boundaries. In fact, not only technical difficulties, but also uh, in many cases, we know that the curves that with boundaries that we are interested in, uh, that we want to count, they are not really well defined um, in the complex analytical world. But in the non-Archimedean world, actually, uh, we have new ways for counting such curves. So it will be like non-Archimedean curves, and uh, that gives rise to uh, the wall crossing formulas uh, for these counts. So, okay. so maybe so maybe one one semi maybe meta philosophical question. So the issue about convergence, um, it's not that convergence doesn't matter, but that convergence is somehow uh, in the in the non-archimedean sense, convergence is is easier to manage and deal with. You can really work with it, and you don't yeah. get these. Yeah. One can also think in terms of this way. In, of right. course, in the eddic setting, we also have some eddic convergence, but uh, that's much easier right. <laughs> than the convergence in complex numbers. Okay, and uh, yeah, so so I remember uh, my collaborator Sean Keo he gave a talk also at the Stanford seminar that's more related to the third uh, uh, point. Yeah, so, okay. So all these advantages, uh, they, uh, all these considerations, they uh, motivate us to find an analog of gromov witten theory uh, in non-Archimedean geometry. So we want to have a, some way to uh, do enumerative geometry because that's what most of the mirror symmetry statements are about. And the, the most basic enumerative theory is gromov witten theory. So we would like to have an analog of it uh, in the non-Archimedean setting. Um, so of course, the first, I, uh, let's just recall that the classical approach uh, to define or to construct gromov witten theory is via uh, perfect abstraction theory developed by uh, Baron Fantecki and uh, Li and Tian. So uh, unfortunately, this theory is very hard uh, to, uh, to be adapted to non-Archimedean geometry, um, mainly for two reasons. Uh, first of all, um, 
in the classical approach, uh, one needs some uh, global resolution of this perfect abstraction complex, uh, which is something that cannot be assumed uh, in the analytic setting. And the second is that uh, we don't really have a good intersection theory uh, in the analytic world. So, yeah, so, so the approach that I will talk about uh, in this talk, uh, which works for the non-Archimedean case, uh, is, is to use a derived geometry. And we develop a theory um, of derived non-Archimedean geometry. And then using the derived structure, we deduce uh, the curve counting invariance. So from the derived structure, we can deduce, deduce both the K-theoretic version, right, which is usually referred to as quantum K invariance, and also the the this cohomological version, the Borromov-Witten invariance. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's a brief uh, uh, introduction of the motivation of our work. I, I, I'm curious whether this is also going to have a chance of resolving some of the um, uh, problems or challenges on the symplectic side of the subject, which is maybe foreign to me where the, some of the foundations are Yeah, so actually uh, that many curve counts that we obtain, they are conjecturally related to many constructions in symplectic geometry, such as symplectic cohomology and uh, also related to some thing of Fukaya category. Some, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's the same story. It's not really, as you see, this non-Archimedean uh, space is what we obtain from a family of complex varieties. We are studying the same object, but just from a different uh, viewpoint, different. Right. Tool. But your methods are quite, um, uh, Precise, uh, I mean, uh, right. It's, uh, you're, you're, yeah. uh, right. So, uh, so you have advantages of, of sort of having foundations that are nice and precise. You can prove things particularly well in this setting, which is from the viewpoint of algebraic geometers. From the point of view of algebraic yeah. geometers, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. So so due to the difficulty of adapting the classical approach uh, to the classical approach to the uh, non-Archimedean world, uh, we develop a theory of derived uh, non-Archimedean geometry. Um, so let me give a brief review of uh, what is derived non-Archimedean geometry. Um, yeah, so I'll just give a quick idea of what is a derived non-Archimedean analytic space. Um, uh, recall, uh, the definition of a derived scheme. Uh, a derived scheme is a pair uh, X O X consisting of a topological space X and a sheaf O X of simplicial commutative rings on X satisfying the following conditions. So first, we ask that if we take a pi zero of this structure sheaf, we get a usual scheme. And the second, uh, if we consider the higher pi i, uh, then they are coherent shifts over pi zero. So naively speaking, a derived scheme, it's just a usual scheme, but also plus some higher, like other terms of the structure shift. So in order to adapt the uh, above definition to analytic geometry, um, we need to find a way to impose additional analytic structures on this shift, uh, on the structure shift. So for example, we would like to have a notion of norm, uh, norms on the sections of OX. And we also would like to be able to compose the sections of uh, 
OX with convergent power series. So yeah, is it possible to give an example for people in the audience who haven't seen an example before of a derived scheme that's not a scheme? Like a, you have your favorite baby example, you can say where people can say, oh yes, that's, that's capturing something or is that just not reasonable? Uh, it's very easy to think. For example, uh, if we have a surface and we have a curve, uh, then if we consider the self intersection of this curve, and this will inherit a non-trivial derived structure, because then, uh, you know, when we take a degree, we we will we are supposed to get the self intersection uh, instead of just the naive intersection. That's why. Perfect. Thank you for the question. So, if we want to enhance it with analytic structure, uh, if we want to adapt the definition to analytic geometry, we need to enhance uh, the structure shift with some analytic structure. Um, our first attempt uh, is to enhance uh, these simplicial commutative rings with some non archimedean analytic structure. So, for example, we should like think of some notion of simplicial commutative uh, affinoid algebra or Banach algebra. So here, simplicial is responsible for the derived for the derived structure, and this affinoid and the Banach algebras are responsible for non archimedean geometry. But the, that's not easy to do because somehow this Banach structure and the simplicial structure, they do not mix well. Uh, there are works in this direction uh, by these authors, uh, but it's still hard to have to fully develop the theory. Mm, our strategy uses uh, the theory of uh, pre-geometry and the, the structure theory of pre-geometry and the structure topos uh, of Jacob Lurie. So the idea is that we use the language of, we will use uh, the language of infinity category and infinity topos to generate derived shifts starting from simple classical objects, um, bypassing any model dependent, dependent constructions. For example, simplicial algebras, DG algebras, and so on. Because we have this trouble of like enhancing these simplicial commutative algebras with analytic structure, and using this powerful theory of uh, Jake Delury, we can somehow bypassing, somehow bypass all these uh, simplicial. Uh, like explicit constructions, and we can somehow generate the derived structure directly out of classical analytic objects. Yeah, so if you never seen it before, it might be a bit uh, uh, seem like quite abstract, but I just give a quick, uh, give you a quick idea. What is this uh, machine? So it's really a formal categorical machine, uh, and uh, yeah, and we start with the definition of what Lurie uh, introduced: a pre-geometry, pre-geometry. So it's a category uh, equipped with uh, a class of admissible morphisms and a gross antique topology, generated by admissible morphisms satisfying. Mm, some axioms. So we ask it to admit finite products, and we ask the admissible morphisms. Um, the class uh, is nice. Yeah, some properties about admissible morphisms. So, so, so maybe because I, I, I really want to understand. So, so. The way we should be thinking about this is the category is going to be something like uh, a uh, the open sets in something, and the admiss some open sets are very nice. The admissible open set, the admissible yeah, morphisms. Yeah. So and let me, yeah. the example. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. 
Great. Yeah, of course, Ravi, the open subsets like the Zariski open embeddings are a perfect example of such pre-geometry. Pre and uh, more generally, we can consider also the etal topology. Like we put uh, etal maps, etal topology. And uh, in the analytic case, we put the same thing, etal maps and etal topology. And it will be apparent uh, in the theory later that actually we only need to include the smooth spaces. Don't even need to consider more complicated things. Somehow, the more complicated singular ones will be generated in this formal procedure by the smooth uh, spaces. So what's missing? Presumably, there's something called a geometry, which is a pre-geometry plus one more thing. What's the missing thing? Ah, so yeah, definitely in Lurie's theory, there is geometry, and then there is pre-geometry. But we, but in the application to derive the geometry later, we only need this notion of pre-geometry. Excellent. Great. Yeah, okay. the geometry is something. So the reason that Lurie he also introduced the geometry is that somehow pre-geometry is not canonical, and somehow different pre-geometry can generate the same geometry what he called a geometric envelope. It's this kind of envelope idea, and we don't need it here. So this one is easier, this pre-geometry actually. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so yeah, so yeah, so somehow once we have the pre-geometry, we can consider, uh, we can consider the analog of like ringed space. So, the analog of this ringed space in this uh, infinite categorical setting is the following. Um, when we fix T pre-geometry and X an infinity topos, uh, if you are not don't like to think infinity topos, you just think of it as uh, the category of sheaves uh, on the given topological space. So then a T structure uh, on X is just a functor from the category T uh, to X satisfying some basic conditions. Ask them to preserve some products, pullbacks, and coverings. Yeah, so that's really the analog of the notion of ring the space. Uh, so the underlying topological space is now replaced by an infinity topos and the ring structure is replaced by the pre-geometry T. Um, uh, so the idea behind this abstract definition uh, is that now when we apply this abstract definition to this analytic structure, so we have this particular pre-geometry given by analytic spaces. And when we think of this T on K structure, and we consider uh, such a structure O, then this thing, this abstract construction can just be thought of as a sheaf of derived rings equipped with an analytic structure. So somehow by this uh, formal uh, process, we kind of completely circumvented all the troubles about defining analytic structures on these Banach algebras and so on, and somehow just starting from very simple, smooth analytic spaces, we are obtain all the derived, like this machine automatically derives uh, this uh, analytic geometry. Yeah, and uh, and it's it, it's easy to see how we are getting the analytic structure just uh, from a, a intuitive way. So, so when we have such a structure O, we can evaluate on A one, on the affine line, and we get uh, a sheaf F or element in the topos. 
And then let's just see how these conditions give us some structures on the sheaf. Um, we have sum and multiplication on the affine line. Then by, by the product preserving condition, we, uh, we obtain also sum and product multiplication on the sheaf. So therefore we can think of the sheaf Think of F as a sheaf of uh, simplicial commutative rings now. And the next, we also have some norm automatically. Because if we consider the closed unit disk D1 in A1, and by uh, the condition about sending admissible pullback of admissible morphisms to pullbacks, and by that condition, we can show that uh, we obtain a monomorphism from O of D1 to F. And intuitively, this gives us a subshift consisting of functions of norm less than or equal to 1. And finally, this functoriality condition also gives us a way uh, of composing composing like sections of our structure shift with any convergent power series. So that's how the magic of this uh, uh, pre-geometry and structure, this structured topos uh, works intuitively. And now we are ready to give the definition of uh, what a derived non archimedean analytic space is. So yeah, so now simply we just replace uh, the classical definition of derived schemes by this a little bit fancier version of this structured topos. So we define that a derived analytic space is a pair X or X consisting of an infinity topos uh, X and the T on K structure. OX satisfying exactly the same conditions as before. So if we take pi zero, we get the same, we get just a classical analytic space. And if we take higher pi j, uh, it's uh, coherent over pi zero. I think last night it was just quasi coherent. Yeah, but it's actually uh, yeah, that's a great question. You know, we have some trouble with quasi coherence in uh, analytic geometry, always, uh, both in complex analytic geometry and in non Archimedean geometry. I mean, once people figure out the general theory of quasi coherence, then it, the definition can be made more general. But it doesn't affect what we want to do for the Gorom of Witten invariants. Thank you for the uh, comment. Okay. Um, so in order to uh, apply the derived theory, we must somehow construct the derived structure uh, in some way. And the way we construct it is via the representability theorem. Um, yeah, with Mauro Porta, we prove that for f an analytic moduli functor uh, that is a shift over the etal site of derived analytic spaces, mm, the following are equivalent. So it, it has a structure of a derived analytic space uh, is equivalent to f being compatible with Posnikov towers has an analytical tangent complex and its truncation is an analytic space. Um, let me remark that uh, this representability theorem uh, has actually tells us two things. First uh, is that our notion of derived analytic space is uh, natural and sufficiently general because any 
reasonable moduli functor is supposed to verify these conditions and now we get uh, and now we always get a derived structure and the second uh, the conditions are actually easy to verify in practice so so the theorem is of practical use that we can just use it to construct uh, plenty of examples of derived structures. So in particular, we can apply it to our uh, to the moduli spaces that we study in gromov witten theory. Um, yeah, so, so the way it goes is that first uh, we show we apply it to the case of mapping stacks because the moduli stacks that we consider in gromov witten theory uh, is the moduli uh, stack of stable maps, which is a sub-stack of the mapping stack. So first of all, we show that the mapping stack uh, has a derived structure. And the second, we apply we apply this mapping stack statement to the stack of stable maps. Um, yeah, so I just uh, quickly I just uh, uh, quickly define that uh, what is a stable map. Uh, sorry, um, uh, sure. since you're just starting this section, um, sorry, there are a lot of words here that I didn't know. So can I just ask a very naive question? Like, um, does your theorem give a 20 dimensional moduli stack of unpolarized K3 surfaces over an non Euclidean field, for example? Yeah, sure. It uh, it also applies to uh, to deformation. You mean for all K3 surfaces? For K3 surfaces, the deformation I think it's unobstructed, right? So probably it has no, the derived structure is probably trivial in this case. Okay, fair enough. Or maybe not. I'm a bit confused. No, no, I think you're right. No, I, think, I think you're right. Um, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. That's my first <laughs> uh, feeling. I will think about it later. But uh, 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 so the, conclusion of the representability theorem is that uh, for any moduli functor, as long as it has all the expected properties, the derived structure is something kind of easy to get. So, so compatibility with Postnikov towers, I'm not sure exactly how I would check that or what that means. That feels the thing. Uh, it, 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 yeah, I put a remark, but I didn't say. It's just uh, uh, means the this usual. Uh, maybe it's this Schlesinger criteria or something. Uh, it's oh, okay, something ah, very okay. simple. Ah, great. Okay. Yeah. And the plus something about uh, uh, the com this in something about when we take lim okay. lim okay. yeah. So it's uh, it, it it's easy to check. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for the great questions. Um, yeah. So, stable map uh, in the non-Archimedean setting is exactly the same definition as uh, the algebraic setting. We just uh, consider um, m-pointed genus G pre-stable curves, family over T, uh, with some sections and a map from this curve C, total space, to X. And we ask that all the geometric fibers uh, have finite automorphisms. So applying the representability theorem, we get uh, derived structure on this, uh, moduli, on this moduli stack of stable maps. Um, yeah, it's stated in this theorem. So this derived moduli stack, in other words, the derived moduli stack 
of m point the genus G stable maps into X is representable by a derived uh, analytic stack locally of finite presentation and also its derived LCI, which is uh, uh, classically called quasi-smooth. But in non-Archimedean geometry, the word quasi-smooth is already used uh, for some other purposes. So we call it derived LCI. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe I should just mention that uh, this derived so in enumerative geometry, to define any enumerative invariance, usually we need to solve two issues. One is uh, transversality, and that's all uh, kind of uh, treated by this derived structure. But another is compactness. And in the non-Archimedean world, uh, the compactness can also be worked out. Uh, we have this. Uh, non archimedean analog of the Gromov compactness theorem. So uh, by bounding the degrees and uh, with some non archimedean version of scalar structure, we can get a proper uh, proper analytic stack. Okay, so so now we have very nice moduli space. We have the pro a proper moduli stack uh, together with uh, uh, derived structure, but but as all we we are interested in are really concrete, uh, like concrete questions in mirror symmetry about uh, uh, the counts of some curves. So we really want want are the some numbers. We all these structures uh, before they are. We, our tools to get numbers. Um, so now let me say something about how to obtain uh, the numerical enumerative invariance uh, from these derived structures. Um, classically, there are two ways of obtaining numerical invariance uh, from this uh, moduli stack of stable maps. So one is uh, we go to K theory, we pass to K theory, and the, the invariants that we obtain are called quantum K invariants, which are studied, uh, proposed uh, and studied by Given Tao and Li. And uh, the more classical or the original version of gromov witten invariants are obtained by passing uh, to intersection theory instead of K theory. And, and it's uh, worked out by Baron Fentek in the algebraic setting and by also by other authors in um, different settings. Um, so we, we can try to do the same or what's the analog of this in, in the non-Archimedean world. Mm, K-theory works similarly in non-Archimedean geometry because eventually it's just uh, vector bundles. Um, we can consider uh, vector bundles and equivalence relations. So we, will, we have this uh, K groups, and then we define the non-Archimedean quantum K invariants um, as in the classical uh, as in the classical case. We pull back, so uh, these are maps from K zero of X um, to the power n to K zero of this moduli stack of uh, pointed stable curves. And we simply pull back the classes on X by the evaluation maps, and we push forward uh, to MGN bar by the stabilization map. So here, the advantage of 
working uh, in the derived setting is that we no longer need to care about this virtual structure shift because this virtual thing is already contained in the derived structure. While in the algebraic case, we also need to tensor with the virtual structure shift. So that's the how we get the k theoretical invariance. But uh, to get the analog of this original gromov witten invariance, it's uh, a lot harder. The reason is that uh, intersection theory, uh, in the sense of Photon's uh, book, does not work in in non-Archimedean geometry, uh, not in complex analytic geometry. The reason is that in analytic geometry, we just don't have enough cycles uh, to have moving lemma uh, in order to do any intersection product. Uh, and in other words, or equivalently, we also don't have enough cycles to have chain classes uh, for vector bundles. Um, so, but we see that eventually, since we are only interested in uh, numbers, we're only interested in getting some concrete numbers, we don't really need an like a uh, detailed intersection theory as in in the algebraic uh, setting uh, we can just work with cohomological theories so you're saying that like the only problem is in some sense the first turn class of line bundles if you can answer that question you could you could do everything and to get around that you're just working with cohomological theories where you can make sense of c1 and that's your that's your game? Yeah, that's that, okay, exactly. Great. Excellent. Ah, great. Because we will just have line bundles and we, we cannot find the sections. So we cannot really define uh, these classes at the cycle level. But once we kind of allow a little bit more freedom, cohomological equivalences such as, then that, that will be fine. Um. Yeah, so the solution is simply to work with cohomological theories. And then we have many choices. So many different cohomological theories are developed uh, for non-Archimedean geometry. Mm -hmm. First of all, we have Adala cohomology. And if we use that, we obtain invariance in QL. Um, it's not so ideal for us because we want to count curves, we don't want our number of curves to be an elliptic number. Um, and later also we have this extra question about independence of L. Um, we also have the Durham cohomology. And if we use Durham cohomology to count the curves, we will get uh, invariance in our base field. It's still a bit strange. Uh, number of curves, it's a Laurent series. We don't like that. Um, so recently, uh, Bayakovic has developed uh, what he called an integral Adala cohomology. It's, um, it's really nice. Uh, it's a really nice theory, and it will allow us to obtain invariance in Q. So uh, we didn't use this because it's the theory is very recent and uh, the functorial properties of the theory are not yet sufficiently developed. And furthermore, uh, the theory is also restrictive in the sense that we must assume the base field to be this. Of course, that's all we need, but, uh, but we have something more general. We can actually do something more general. Um, so, uh, we chose to work with uh, the theory of rigid analytic uh, motivic cohomology uh, developed by Ayub. And it works over more general non Archimedean fields, not necessarily this one. And uh, furthermore, uh, we have the six functor formalism 
recently developed by Ayub uh, uh, and uh, his collaborators. So, so roughly, for any analytic space, k analytic space X, we have uh, this infinity category of a tau k analytic motives over X uh, with rational coefficients. Mm, so, and, and they also constructed uh, the six functors formalism. And once we have the six functors, we can define uh, the analog of motivic cohomologies uh, as in the algebraic setting. So, and, so is there any chance that, I mean, is it going to be so, is what you're, I'm guessing where it's going to go, but I'm guessing I'm wrong, uh, that, that uh, you're, that what you're doing is formal enough and using the, 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 the six functors that you could work simultaneously in Etal, Duram, or rigid analytic, and then somehow get something which you know is in Q and QL and in K, and because it's a number here by, you know, it's, uh, well, I guess you're not going to get anything else. It's all in Q. But yeah, so really, yeah. that's the idea of motives. Uh, here, we just work with the, this motivic theory because uh, it's the six functor formalism, it's uh, well developed. While in other theories, it's harder to find all these pieces in the literature where everything. Right. Yeah. But, but, but you're not using anything other, than, well, you must be using, are you using things beyond the six functor? What are you using beyond the six functor formalism? You must be using some special ingredients as well, or is it just that? Almost just that, but that's the right. bulk of the theory. The six functions yes, are very okay. hard to construct. Yes. Um, so once we have the six functors, we can define as usual, the motivic cohomology and uh, homology. You know that uh, this theory is really nice because in the algebraic case, this recovers the Cho groups. And in the analytic case, we don't have Cho groups, but this uh, recovers something that we just don't know. <laughs> but it has the good properties to produce for us uh, the numbers that we want. Yeah, and uh, uh, next uh, we can apply a derived analog uh, of deformation to the normal cone um, following Kahn. So Kahn and the uh, read, they constructed uh, a deformation to the uh, normal bundle in the derived case. So uh, they have, if we have anything, morphism x to y, um, derived LCI, then we have this uh, deformation, the whole space over y times a1, and the derived LCI morphism X times A1 to the total space, such that the fiber outside the zero is the same as before, and that fiber over zero becomes this uh, normal bundle, or in this derived language, it's zero section uh, to the shifted tangent bundle. And once we have this deformation to the normal bundle, uh, we take specialization and the homotopy equivalence map. Uh, this gives us uh, the virtual fundamental class. Um, it can be thought of as a derived analog of uh, work of this uh, construction by Baron Fantecki, but uh, but the, de the derived version is just uh, so nice that we don't need to worry about uh, this intrinsic, what is it called, intrinsic normal cone and all these constructions because uh, somehow uh, everything is contained in the derived structure and we don't care about this uh, underived version anymore. We don't care. Intrinsic normal cone is really something about the truncation like the classical moduli space, which somehow does not really play a role uh, for us. Yeah. And 
So yeah, so then once we have this, uh, this uh, framework, uh, we can simply define this Gromov written invariance as um, as in the classical setting. So we use this motivic cohomology, we pull back the classes by the evaluation maps, we intersect with the virtual fundamental class, we push forward um, by the stabilization map, and uh, since sometimes it's homology or cohomology, <laughs> we just pass to cohomology. In Okay, um, yeah, in the last few minutes, let me just say something about properties of this invariance. Um, we constructed uh, the invariance through this derived structure and uh, some uh, either this K theory or this uh, cohomology theory then we need to establish all the expected properties uh, of our non-Archimedean invariance. Um, so, so this, uh, they will actually follow readily from a list of natural geometric relations uh, between the derived moduli stacks. The idea is that we just prove enough geometric relations between the moduli stacks without uh, thinking about either K-theory or cohomologies. And then once we apply K-theory or any cohomology theory, all the expected properties of the counts will just follow directly. So in order to state uh, these geometric relations, uh, we work with a slight combinatorial refinement um, of this stack of stable maps. Um, uh, they are called tau beta marked stable maps uh, for any A graph. Yeah, it's some refinement uh, introduced by Baron and Manning for the study of properties of gromov witten invariants. So then we have the associated moduli stacks. And uh, we prove that these associated moduli stacks of these refined uh, stable maps, they satisfy uh, all the expected geometric relations with respect to elementary operations on these graphs. So we have products, um, we have this derived a uh, pullback diagram when we cut an edge of the graph. We have the universal curve uh, diagram, this derived pullback diagram when we forget a tail. And actually when we forget the tail, we have another derived pullback. And also we have a relation when we uh, contract edges. So let me just remark that all these relations are only at the level of this derived moduli spaces. And it seems something kind of uh, trivial or formal, but actually they contain all the information about these curve counts. So, so for example, uh, this universal curve relation in the particular case where the graph is a point, it just says that the forgetful map, forgetting uh, a point, uh, is equivalent to the universal curve. So this is something easy in in the non-derived case. But in the derived case, it still holds. And such an intuitive statement, in fact, uh, incorporates all the information about the virtual counts uh, with respect to forgetting a tail. And classically, uh, this forgetting tail axiom 
uh, is expressed and proved uh, in terms of uh, pullback properties of perfect abstraction series and intrinsic double cones, uh, while here in the derived language, it's the same statement as for the non-derived stack. Yeah. So, so is it, am I right in, so these statements, there's the classical version of these statements and then there's your derived version of these statements. What's tricky in the classical version of the statements comes at this point in the argument. But you're saying, if I understand you correctly, what's in your case, all the hard work was done before. In, in other words, it's built in to the structure of these things where really it's not so hard to prove these things because of what's come before. Is that right? Yeah, so so, so somehow, yeah, so uh, yeah, so somehow um, now all the hard work is somehow in the proofs, the statements uh, regarding involving these derived structures are exactly the same uh, without the derived like without the right. derived structures it's just right. very intuitive everyone can guess and right. uh, and these uh, statements from which we can deduce everything we want yeah mm, okay so let me stop here thank you very much uh, for your